So hello everyone, and um, thank you for joining our presentation today. We are very happy to be in Lisbon in the UN Ocean Conference 2022, and um, joined together here for a common goal, so uh, saving our oceans and the life below. Um, my name is Zeynep Ozenay, and I am the Business Development Manager of Blue Regeneration, a Spain-based company, uh, and we are a blue carbon company. And Blue Regeneration has partnered with uh, Global Coral Reef Alliance, the inventors and developers of Biorock technology. And I will leave the floor to Dr. Thomas Goro, who is one of the founders of Biorock technology and has unparalleled knowledge and experience with Biorock for over 45 years, and even more with restoring our oceans around the world. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Zeynep. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, we're here today to talk about biorock technology for solving the most important coastal problems that we face, including protecting beaches from sea level rise, protecting coral reefs and other marine ecosystems from global warming and pollution, and developing new methods for whole ecosystem sustainable mariculture. We'll also talk about carbon negative building materials as well a little bit. So the point is that this is a technology that's applicable to a wide variety of marine issues and, and problems, and it turns out to be the most cost-effective solution we'll try to show you. This one? Yes. <clears throat> okay. And so we're going to talk first of all a bit about um, the problem of beach erosion and how Biorock can solve that, the bit of the history and the properties and some of the solutions that we've applied to protecting beaches and ecosystems around the world. Now, we all know that we're in the middle of a climate emergency and beaches are, are sort of the front line of climate change uh, with global sea level rise um, affecting them and with a global warming making the storm stronger and the waves bigger. Uh, we're going to first show you a photograph of a short film here of the problem of beach erosion. And this area that we're going to show you is San Juan, Puerto Rico. This is the major tourist beach on a major tourism island in the Caribbean. This is the Santurza Beach. And this is a video taken with a drone showing the beach being flooded. This is not a hurricane. This is just an ordinary storm in the North Atlantic thousands of miles away, but as you can see, the water now is more and more washing right over the beach, over the road, and the beach itself has disappeared. What you see in front is wherever they put seawalls, the beach has disappeared. Offshore, you see the waves breaking on the coral reef. There used to be a wonderful live coral reef in front of this beach, and that's why the beach was there in the first place, but now almost all those corals are dead. Instead of those corals growing back and restoring themselves after every hurricane. Now they're crumbling and collapsing. They're being riddled with holes. And so the protection that made the beach is steadily disappearing. So the future of this beach is not very good. Now it's said that half of the world's beaches will disappear by the end of the century if the present rates of erosion continue, but they're not. Sea level rise is accelerating, global warming is accelerating and the strength of storms are increasing. So we're gonna lose much more than half of the beaches of the century. So all major coastal cities, all major low-lying coastlines, literally billions of people could become climate change refugees and whole countries could disappear. Um, whoops. I'm now going to show you what people do to protect coastlines against erosion. The traditional solution are seawalls. And this is a seawall on the same beach in, in San Juan, Puerto Rico. This is the other end of the beach where they built seawalls. And what you see when the waves hit that, oops, what happened here? How do I do it? Okay, how do I play that? Uh-huh, sorry. You can see the waves come in and when they hit the vertical wall, they get much higher than the wave that came in. So that all the force of the wave is concentrated right on that wall. And what that does is that washes away all the sand in front of that wall and then all the sand underneath until the wall collapses. And if you look very carefully at this video, what you'll actually see here is that at the end over here, all these pylons here that you can see sticking out of the water are the remains of old seawall collapsed in the past. So what happens is when the seawall falls down because of the 
erosion caused by the wall itself, they have to build a new one and it's a constant situation of retreat. And it's a guaranteed business because the seawall will have to be rebuilt forever. Now, if we were to protect all of the coastlines of the world with seawalls, a typical seawall costs about $15 million per kilometer. And to protect the world's coastlines from sea level rise would probably take something like 20 or $25 trillion at the cost, present cost of seawalls, which is about a quarter or a third of the global economy. So it's an incredible amount of money. So that's a strategy that fails and is extremely expensive. We're presenting an alternative solution to bio rock electric reefs. And here's an example of that. And this is a living, growing reef with an open mesh framework that absorbs wave energy instead of reflecting. The waves pass right through it. It acts like a real reef or its permeable structure. And what we do is we use electricity. In this case, we build structures out of steel. And these are pieces of what we call bio rock material. They're grown out of the seawater. It doesn't happen naturally. A little trickle of electricity to a steel structure does several things. First, it stops all rusting on the steel. That steel will never rust and corrode. And then we grow solid rock over it. And these pieces here mostly came from the Maldives. And they're about two years of growth on little steel bars. And um, this material itself is about two to three times harder than ordinary concrete. And the amount of energy it takes to produce it is, is a lot less than it takes to produce concrete. So actually, this is not only harder than concrete, it's also cheaper to produce. Um, in the upper left, you see a picture of a bio rock material that was grown in Louisiana in the 1970s by Professor Wolf Hilbert, who's the original inventor of this technology. And he did it in order to produce building materials in the sea. His idea was to grow walls and blocks and roofs and then take them out to use the sea as the world's largest mine and produce material, building material from the ocean. And um, the very first project he did is in the upper left. And what happened is three months later, they came back and adult oysters had settled and grown, or rather oysters had settled and all over and grown to adult size in just three months. That showed some of the properties of this material. Um, <clears throat> the reason we started to do it was because We've been watching the reefs, coral reefs of the world die since the 1940s. My family has been documenting that since the 1940s. And uh, at the time, um, by the 80s, we were in a very serious condition. The 1980s is when we passed a, a tipping point for global bleaching, when it got too hot for coral reefs. And ever since then, we've had mass coral bleaching. And we've seen the reefs steadily die every time it gets warm. The next Del Nino is going to wipe out many of the corals that are left in the world. And that's going to probably start later this year. So it's a very serious issue. So originally we began, Wolf began producing building materials. Then I invited him to Jamaica, which is where I'm from. And we, I asked him to come and work with me applying it to growing corals. And uh, that's what we've done ever since. So this is an example of a bio rock reef. This is from Indonesia. We use a tiny little trickle charge of electricity that you cannot feel in the water, it's so low. And that, that causes not only the limestone growth, as you see the corals grow like mad all over it, at record rates, they grow typically three to five times faster than normal, but some even more than that. And it's not just coral, all forms of marine life are attracted to these structures. They grow faster than normal and they resist environmental stresses that would normally kill them. So they're, they're extremely hardy. And so we're able to, with this method to keep reefs alive when they would die because of high temperature, because of pollution, because of, of, of uh, you know, storm damage and other things, and they grow back very quickly. And we're able to regenerate coral reefs in places where there's no natural regeneration. That's a really crucial point. We're able to do this in areas that are severely polluted, and I'll show you some examples of that later. So, um, as we mentioned, we use a trickle charge of electricity to grow limestone rock over steel, and it's the same material that coral reefs are made of. It's what coral, baby corals want to settle on. All marine reef organisms want to settle on clean limestone. We grow that. They won't settle on exotic materials like rubber tires or concrete blocks and, uh, or you know, plastic. All, people are putting all sorts of artificial reefs made of artificial materials. Very few corals settle on them. They can glue corals onto them, but as you'll see, they mostly die. 
that they don't run by a lot because we're producing the material that they want. They're also growing faster and they're more resistant to stress. There's another unique feature of our structures. And this is a, a photograph from Bali in Indonesia. And this is a bio rock reef that has been hit by a boat. This has been 11 years in the water. And what you see is the boat smashed off in the circle, some of the limestone rock. And you can see the bare metal that's been in the sea for 11 years has no rust on it at all. And a year later, it grows back. So this is a structure that's growing. It gets stronger with age. It heals itself. It's the only marine construction material in the world that does that. Every other marine construction material deteriorates from the day you put it in the water and they proceed to disappear. <clears throat> Another feature of the limestone we produce is that it's actually carbon neutral or carbon negative. Each ton of Portland cement that's produced, and that's the world's most common building material, produces a ton of CO2. So nearly 10% of all this anthropogenic CO2 in the world comes from concrete manufacturers, a major source of CO2. The biorock material that we produce is either CO2 neutral, and it can be done in a negative way. So that, that, that it actually absorbs CO2 out of the atmosphere. I say it's harder, it's cheaper than concrete, and it's permanent, as we'll show you a little later. It's like the pyramids of Egypt in the last thousands of years. Uh, here's a biorock reef, and this is one from Indonesia. And what we've done in this case is we've grown the structure, we've put on tiny fragments of natural broken coral, and they grow at an incredibly fast rate, and they attract huge numbers of fish and other marine organisms. We have you can build them in any size or shape. So here's an example. This is one that's designed specifically as a wave breaking device. It's designed, with, it's like an up down, upside down wave. And it's designed to allow the waves to pass through it and have the wave energy absorb. A healthy coral reef will absorb up to 97% of the wave energy that comes into the beach. So these are, in a sense, artificial reefs. We can build them where the reefs have been destroyed or damaged or where there never was any reef at all. And what they will do is slow down the waves offshore so that when the waves hit the shore, they deposit sand instead of washing it away. Uh, here are some examples of modules that we can build as, uh, as wave absorbing devices and uh, I'll show you plenty of examples of that in this talk. We can build them any size or shape. There's absolutely no limit. And what's interesting is if we build two different structures side by side of different shapes, we get different species of fish crowding into them. So each one is looking for a different size or shape of hole to hide in or to hunt for food. And so we can, it's quite amazing the differences we see. Um, some examples here is of barrel rock um, reef rescue. This is in Jamaica. This is in 2020. And in Jamaica, we had two hurricanes, category five hurricanes started in December, long after the hurricane season should have been over. They did a lot of damage. We couldn't get into the water for about a month. Immediately after the second hurricane, we went in and we searched for small, naturally broken fragments of coral. We put them on bio rock reefs, and here they are a year later. They're growing extremely fast, dividing rapidly. And what we're doing is we're building a reef up above the bottom where it's more efficient for absorbing wave energy. So here we've rescued corals from hurricanes, maintained them and got them to grow. The coral on the left was just destroyed by that hurricane. It was broken off. It rolled around upside down on the rocks and sand for about two months before we get there and rescue it. We wired it up to buy a rock reef. And now it's practically completely healed. The damaged area has grown back over with tissue. New skeletons formed over the area that have been completely abraded away. So we're speeding up the growth and we're greatly increasing the natural healing capacity of, of corals and other marine organisms. The picture on the right is the first bio rock reef that we built in Jamaica in the 1980s. And that's me tending it there. And what you see on it are fragments of coral that I rescued in this bay. Almost all the corals have died from pollution. The algae had smothered and killed them. There were almost no corals left alive, and they were dying. We rescued little fragments of them, put them on the bio rock reef, and they tripled in size in three months. They were growing at faster than record rates for that species in water quality that was so poor they should have been dying. We also, you can see these fragments that I transplanted on, and they proceeded to proliferate and grow very fast. And the thing that you see in the front here is 
at calcareous or coralline algae. That's what builds a beach sand. So we're also producing new sand as well as protecting the sand on the beach. This is that same structure 30 years later and it's had no electricity for 30 years. People ask us, well, you know, what happens when you turn the power off? Well, this structure is so solidly attached to the sea floor, it cemented itself with limestone onto the rock. And even though it has had no power, even though it's no longer growing and no longer able to repair itself, which is damaged, it has survived every hurricane that's hit Jamaica for 30 years. So that's a, a very important point. This is another fire rock reef that's had no power. This one is in Panama. This one has had no electricity for 20 years. All the corals we put on top of it are in beautiful condition and we're growing sponges all over it. This is a very muddy location. In fact, many of these corals that you see here couldn't normally grow on the site because it's too dark and too muddy for them, but we've managed to grow them very well. And also we're growing huge numbers of sponges. That's really important because the sponges filter bacteria out of the water. And when we build sponge reefs, we help clean up the water quality and remove bacteria and sediments and other things. So there's another application of bio rock reefs is we can grow reefs to filter harbor waters and clean polluted waters. It's not just coral, we grow all species of marine life on these structures. These are some bio rock reefs that are in um, the Turks and Caicos Islands. And somewhere here, I don't see it. There's a diver here. Oh, up here, you can barely see it. This is a human being for scale, that little person up there. And these photographs were taken just before and just after two Category 5 hurricanes hit this island three days apart, destroyed about 90% of all the houses and buildings on this island. And as you can see, actually, so this is, these are switched. The one on the, on the, this is the before slide on the right. And the one on the left is the after slide. And the reason I can tell that is what you see here is that after the hurricane, the sand built up under the structure, buried the lowest part of it under the sand. All the corals remained, and those corals were corals that had been rescued from a cruise ship pier site. The propeller of the cruise ships were killing a whole reef by, by dumping sand and mud. They rescued those corals, we put them on, and they were not damaged at all. Now this structure, amazingly enough, was not even welded and was not attached to the sea floor. It was just sitting on the bottom under its own weight. And it was tied together with wires by hand. It wasn't welded. But as you can see, the hurricane waves passed right through it, deposited sand, did no damage to the structure of the corals. But also at the same time, it removed half of the concrete blocks that we had in here. We had sort of concrete blocks as artificial reef controls. Half of them got thrown completely out by the hurricane because they were solid and they had much more scour. And in the background, you can see those are natural reef and they were concrete reef balls here. And those literally buried themselves in the sand. There was so much erosion and scour around them that they literally sank into the sand and some of them disappeared. So they, they cause erosion where the fire rock reef causes, causes sand to build up. And what we can do is we can generate reefs in areas that had no reefs. Both of these locations are in Bali. These are four-year-old bio rock reefs. And they're both in places where there was nothing. It was barren sand with a little bit of broken coral rubble. There were no fish. And so this is in just four years of reefs that we made. They've got thousands of fish around them, schooling inside and outside. And they've, they've created a, an ecotourism attraction that has in fact built up the entire economy of what used to be the poorest village in Bali and is now one of the richest because people come from all over the world to see these spectacular coral reefs in an area that has very little left. So we're able to, in that sense, increase biodiversity where there wasn't any. And we can do this with any source of power. This is very important to understand. We can do it with solar power, with electricity from winds, from waves, from uh, currents, from batteries, from, and, and from conventional energy. There's no limit. It's a site-specific decision because at each place, obviously, we want to use clean energy because global warming is the number one killer of coral. So we don't like to use fossil fuel CO2. And uh, we try whenever possible to use sustainable energy. And we will generally in the future. We've developed a bio rock in a box system, which is a smart, energy efficient, plug and play, cloud connected, real time data monitoring control system. 
for do-it-yourself bio rock projects. This will be a small kit, well, come in various sizes, and uh, it can be, depending on what's needed, it can use either grid electricity or direct current from solar panels or from inverters, no, not from inverters, but from transformers that have been converted AC to DC or stepped down direct current. Um, and um, this will be con remotely controlled and will transmit information in real time to cell phones, a data log that so we'll know exactly how it's performing. If uh, there's damage to the structure, it will tell us right away. So this, is, this will be very important. And we're going to have a range of sizes of the fire rock in a box kit that range from small ones that can be used with a single solar panel on a float, um, for example, uh, to protect moorings or to, to grow mussels or other purposes, grow small reefs, up to very large units that can grow structures that might be hundreds of meters long, protect entire beaches or even entire islands. So these will be scalable. And those will be available soon this year. <clears throat> so Fire Rock in a Box will have many applications and um, uh, please contact Blue Regeneration for more information on their availability. Um, be coming out this year. Oh, with biorock technology, we regenerate biodiversity and ecosystem services. That's one of the astonishing things is that we build structures, we put a few corals on, but everything else in the reef comes to the biorock reef by themselves. They settle on the structures of much higher densities than they do on the surrounding reef, or they migrate. Juvenile fish, for instance, crowd around our structures. So and it works in all marine ecosystems. As long as the water is salty and will conduct electricity, we'll, we can grow it. So we can't do it in fresh water, but we can do it in fairly brackish water. You know, that's a mixture. In all these habitats, we find that we're growing organisms at record rates. And of course, we get the best results in the cleanest waters. But what is most interesting is we get results in the dirtiest waters where nobody else can get results. And so these structures cost a fraction of, of a concrete wall or the cans of artificial reefs that people normally make. They're much cheaper because they're made from steel frameworks. It's the most common, cheapest building material in the world, and we can make any size or shape. And we don't have to buy concrete. We don't have to. It's just much faster and cheaper to build. So this works in all coastal ecosystems. I've shown you pictures of coral reefs, but in cold waters, we grow oyster reefs. I'll show some pictures of some of these, these other systems as well. So it, it will work in any ecosystem. Uh, we can do that. We can do floating reefs. We can do deep water reefs. So we can basically replace rock and concrete walls that provide no ecosystem surface to fall and cause erosion. With bio rock reefs that regenerate ecosystem surface, regenerate fisheries habitat, and at the same time, cost much less and grow beaches back naturally, which seawalls never do. So it's a really fundamental breakthrough because we stimulate the growth, the settlement and survival and resistance to extreme stress of all marine organisms that we have looked at. It's quite astonishing. We've done something like more than 600 bio rock reefs around the world. Some of these places that you see here have up to 150 bio rock reefs, for example, in Bali in Indonesia, Lombok in Indonesia, and other places. Other places might have 50, 20. Some places we've only built one. These are all the places around the world that we've worked in around 45 countries and done pilot projects. And there are a couple here that we haven't done yet, like in Chile uh, and Tanzania that we're about to do in the coming months. So these are, these are projects that are funded and uh, in the works, but al almost all of these are existing, but many of them were pilot projects or only run temporarily because of lack of funding or because no one was there to maintain them. So not, not all of these are still in existence, but these are where it has all worked. And as you can see, a wide range of habitats, including mostly in the tropics, because we're mostly trying to save reefs, but it works with oyster reefs, it works in cold water environments as well. So that's what's really astonishing. Uh, we've done work in the, in the the Arctic, <laughs> who've done work with deep sea corals in Sweden, for example. So some of the applications that we mentioned, first of all, we'll, we'll, we'll go into this in a little more detail, beach restoration and shore protection, marine ecosystem regeneration and sustainable mariculture. <clears throat> With beach regeneration, well, as we mentioned, the key thing is the erosive energy of the waves. 
and we're trying to absorb that energy and prevent it from washing away the sand, the traditional methods are extremely expensive and they don't work in the long run. They don't work. They all ultimately fall down because, as I say, they cause reflection and erosion in front of them. So um, examples are shown in these pictures. The waves reflect off vertical walls. As you saw in that image from Puerto Rico, and they wash away the sand underneath. Uh, when the groins are horizontal structure, they tend to trap sand on the upstream side and they cause erosion on the downstream side. So whenever people build it, somebody is very happy and somebody is very unhappy, their neighbor downstream. So these are the traditional hard rigid solutions. Well, the advantages are that they, once you build them, they, they work as well, until they fall down. But um, there are a lot of disadvantages because they tend to trap sand and the erosion in the long term increases and they have to be rebuilt endlessly forever. It's extremely expensive to build and they cost a lot to repair. They cost a lot to repair every time they have to be repaired. And there's a, a very high energy use that goes into the placing of the stones or, or manufacturing of the concrete. Here are some examples um, here in, in uh, of how biorock affects seawalls. The seawall that you see on the left is in Indonesia. And when we began, the seawall was one year old. The reflection off the seawall had caused the sand in front of it to be washed away. So there's a gap underneath the wall and the wall was about to collapse. We built a bunch of biorock reefs in front of this beach. And one year later, the sand had piled up about a meter. The hole under the, the uh, seawall had been filled in and the, the beach piled up against the seawall because the bio rock reefs in front protected it. If you now turn around and look behind you, this is the next door neighbor. There used to be a road running along here. It's disappeared. The trees have fallen to the sea. So the bio rock made a huge difference. You can see the sandbags here. Just none of those things work. Now, if we now look at another seawall, it's the same age as this one, that's behind this fallen tree here, that seawall was built two years before and it had already fallen down. This one did not have a bio rock reef in front of it. The bio rock reef you see was behind that building behind it. So it shows the difference. And uh, here's another example here. Here's a seawall also in Indonesia. It's caused waves reflecting off the seawall to wash away this whole beach that was next to it. Well, here are some more examples of failed seawalls from Indonesia. People go to enormous expense buying concrete, importing rocks to places where they don't have any. They build them, and this is what happens. They fall down. Here's a village, a fishing village in Indonesia that uh, you, know, you can see what's happening with their buildings. What they've had to do, therefore, was to, the government came in, they built a huge concrete wall, and within a couple of years, the beach in front of that seawall washed away began to be undermined and the seawall was about to collapse. So they then had to go and spend even more money dumping the rocks to prevent the seawall from falling down. So it's extremely expensive, extremely expensive to do this. Uh, there are other traditional shore protection solutions. They're all expensive. They're all also temporary. Now, the sand tubes, well, they get ripped apart by the first storm. The vertical pilings tend to trap sand. Well, beach drainage, that's a complicated process where they put pipes underneath the beach and try to pump water out. Sand dredging and dumping is the most popular thing. I mean, huge amounts of money are spent dredging, pumping and dumping sand on beaches. And it's usually gone before the end of the season because there's nothing to protect it. You can pile all the sand you want on a beach, but if you don't have a reef in front to reduce the wave energy, that sand is going to disappear. There's tourist beach after tourist beach all around the world doing this stuff until they run out of sand to dredge. Uh, sand bypassing is another solution. There you have to pump sand around structures and that's also very expensive. And there are artificial reefs. This is a concrete artificial reef. It's several years old in Thailand. And they look awful because almost nothing wants to grow in concrete. What you get are stinging organisms, algae. We call them slime balls so because they, they they don't look like real coral reefs. <laughs> I've seen concrete in the water all my life, but I've never seen them turn into reefs. But people constantly dumping concrete into the water and claiming that reefs will grow on them, which is something that we've never seen. <laughs> so um, all of these so-called solutions are very expensive. They're temporary. 
and they cause erosion. So, so what do we do with fire rock? Well, here's an example. Here's an eroding beach, a cross section. Uh, without fire rock, the erosion will just continue and the beach will retreat. With fire rock, we put fire rock structures in front, we reduce the wave of energy at the shore, and the beach grows. And we've grown beaches back at record rates naturally this way. It's quite astonishing. So this is sort of a schematic example of what can be done or a large scale model. This is a proposed project in, in Andalusia in Southern Spain that we hope to be doing quite soon. It's been permitted, but we're still waiting on the funding. And we can make modular solutions that both modules in terms of the units, the bio rock recently put, and we space them out and then we power them uh, we can power them with power supplies in groups so they can be controlled separately. So this is our central strategy. We don't use huge power plants, we use small, small power, uh, power solutions along the beach. This is an example of a beach in Indonesia. Now, before we began, there was a cliff in the beach. The beach was steadily eroding. I'd, I'd known this beach for quite a number of years. Every time I came, the cliff was moving inland, more trees had fallen in, and the buildings kept collapsing. They kept moving them inland before they would fall into the sea. So you can see these pictures before. Then we built a bunch of small bio rock reefs in front of this eroding beach, and within months, this entire beach grew back. As you can see, this is the building that was about to fall down. That's a tree that had fallen down. They were buried in the sand. The beach grew vertically upward by about a meter and a half. It grew about 40 meters wider and it grew a couple hundred meters long. So that was, um, and it backs up with no, no pumping or sand, just by growing bio rock roots. Here you can see the bio rock roots offshore. This is extreme low tide at this point. They're underwater, high tide. Uh, normally we would have them underwater, but here they wanted the protection right away. And obviously the closer to shore, the more effective it is. So um, and we couldn't grow corals on the top but only on the bottoms, the bottoms are in the water all the time. Uh, normally we would not have it exposed, but in this case, the erosion was so severe that they were willing to uh, have the uh, reefs visible. <clears throat> and here you see the island where we grew back the beaches. There's about 50 bio rock reefs in this cluster and about another 20 on this side over here. Um, this is Pulau Ganga in Indonesia. This is some Google Earth images. As you can see before the beach was pretty narrow. These little dots here are the bio rock reefs in the seagrass beds. And um, you can see here the beach has grown much wider. And some more Google Earth images before. And what you can see here is the beach was pretty narrow at this end. And uh, we grew it right out here, the bio rock reefs, those little white dots. And the uh, beach extended quite a bit. This is another example from the Maldives. Now, the Maldives, every island has an erosion problem. Every tourism resort in the Maldives has their beaches behind sandbags or rock walls in order to keep them from washing away. And this is a resort in the Maldives where the trees were falling to the sea and had a real issue. This building here was about to collapse into the sea when we began. We grew in 1997 at Bio Rock Reef, which is that dark line right in front of that beach. And that beach grew back by itself. This is the first picture with the sandbags was taken right over here. And this building here had sandbags piled in front and the owners of the hotel told us they couldn't possibly save that building. They would have to tear it down because it's going to fall down. And they gave the beach pop that now. So even more interesting was that we built this reef in 1997. 1998 was the hottest year in the Maldives. 95 to 99% of the corals died. About 99% of the corals in the reef in front of this beach died in a couple of weeks. I, I watched it happen. The corals that we were growing on the bio rock reef almost all survived the high temperatures, even though it was incredibly hot. And as a result, all the fish moved out of the dead reef into the bio rock reef. And so for about 10 or 15 years, this is the only resort in the Maldives that had a natural beach with a live coral reef full of living corals and packed full of fish. Everybody else had dead rubble. So it, was, uh, it really worked. <clears throat> so, um, what we do with bio rock is to regenerate entire marine ecosystems. Uh, all coastal marine ecosystems are dying. And uh, we hear a lot of people at this conference talking about 
the blue economy. And the blue economy, we're not going to have a blue economy if we don't have healthy living coastal marine ecosystems. That's where almost all our fish come from. And we're killing them from the pollution we dump into the coast, the sewage fertilizer, the toxic chemicals, the soil erosion, and then now most of all from global warming. So if we don't regenerate our marine ecosystems, there will be no, no blue economy. What BioRock does is create the ideal biophysical conditions for growing all marine ecosystems. And I will show you, it's not just coral reefs, it includes oyster reefs, salt marshes, and seagrass. And we can do it even under the, the worst conditions that people have asked us to work under. This is a picture from Indonesia. And this is one of the reefs that we grew that grew back that beach. And what you can see is the structure we put in has been buried by coral growth from the bottom up. These are little fragments of coral that were in the, in the seagrass that proceeded to grow and proliferate. Um, the seagrass has grown very green and very tall, accelerating the growth of that. And all fish, crabs, sea urchins, everything else has moved into these structures. We actually recreated the biodiversity and the ecosystem that used to be in front of this area and rebuilt the fish populations at the same time with biorock. Here's another example. This is in the Mediterranean. And here we're growing seagrass on bare rock. That's something people thought was impossible to do. And literally, we put down a small bio rock mesh part by a solar panel on rock here. And we grew a whole, we planted some seagrass in between and the seagrass grew so fast. You can see a close up here. The roots proliferated. They attached themselves to bare rock. Mussels grew on them, oysters moved in, shrimps and crabs and worms, baby fish. We created whole little mini ecosystems there. And you can see two of them here in the picture. The controls all died. They, they would not survive. So we were able to greatly accelerate seagrass growth. And that's very, very important because, as, as I'll mention later, seagrass, salt marshes, and mangroves are the best form of storing carb, blue carb. It's the cheapest way of storing CO2, the most CO2 in the least area at the lowest cost. This is salt marsh. This, in this case here, you can see we're using a small solar panel in the background and we're growing salt marsh. And this is in a toxic waste dump in New York City. And the salt marsh that we're growing is growing very tall. It's proliferating underground with the roots, has many more stems. They grow taller, they flower earlier, but they're also much more densely clumped than many more plants. The built mussels have settled in and they've grown. They've raised the entire sea floor here about 10 centimeters. And this picture here, they've literally built a beach. That clump of seagrass is in this corner, but this beach was not there before. And it uh, survived Hurricane Sandy, which washed away most of the beaches in New York City. And that's all being done with one solar panel. In addition, at this site, which I say was so toxic that everything had died, we were growing oysters. And the oysters we grew grew about eight times faster than normal. And what's more is they kept growing all winter long. All survived. They never stopped growing through the winter, whereas the controls almost all died over the winter. So this is a, you know, an example of how we can regenerate so many ecosystems. Again, here, this huge blue carbon sequestration, biomass, and organic carbon and sediments. So we were able to increase the storage of organic carbon a great deal uh, with this method. Other applications are sustainable mariculture. And um, here, we're, 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 this is a mussel raft. Uh, pretty certainly in Galicia and Spain. They're hanging from rafts. And we're about to start a project there with researchers in Galicia um, who are growing mussels to try to use bio rock to increase the growth of mussels on structures just like this. Here is an example of how bio rock affects mussel growth. This mesh here had no electricity. That's a control. This one on the left got a little Crickle of electricity, this one here in the middle got more. And these are muscles that spontaneously settled and grew. We didn't put them there. And you can see how the electricity attracted the settlement and uh, probably greater growth as well. So we're able to do this with many other species. And so we're eager to, we're applying this to sustainable aquaculture. The thing that's important is that what we're not doing like most aquaculture, most aquaculture grows a single species usually a single clone of a single species. They destroy the biological diversity. We're growing entire ecosystems with all the components of those ecosystems. 
everything is in there. And so they're generating their own food. Most mariculture throws food into the water to feed their organisms. A lot of that rots on the bottom and pollutes the environment. The waste from the fish pollute the environment, they kill off some of the ecosystems. They cause toxic algae blooms because of that pollution. And it, they, they're causing huge problems. So we, we're basically doing whole ecosystem mariculture of systems that grow their own food. What we have to do is figure out how to design it in a way that the species we want to grow are the ones that are most favored. And we're learning how to do that, but we believe we can adapt this to the mariculture of most shellfish and fish. Let me give one example. I, I build habitat for lobster, spiny lobster in Jamaica and Panama, Mexico and places. And we get dozens or hundreds of lobsters in just a couple square meters when we build the habitat that they're looking for. They're limited by lack of hiding places. If you build them what they want, they crowd right in. We're also growing the food for them. So this is a remarkable solution. So there are a lot of opportunities here. We can, and as I mentioned, we save corals from bleaching. It's the only method known in the world that saves corals from dying from bleaching. We grow back beaches where nobody else does. We grow salt marsh and sea grasses and blue carbon. Um, and we create whole sustainable ecosystem mariculture, which is going to be a huge application. Furthermore, as I say, we can grow building materials in the ocean that do not produce CO2 like Portland cement or even absorb it. And those are going to be cheaper and harder than concrete to produce along coastlines anywhere in the world. So developing those materials is also going to contribute because as Wolf Hilbert's original goal was to grow buildings in the sea, and now that will, we can do that to help reverse climate change. So uh, I think that's where I'll stop. There's a lot more to say, but um, I think that's, um, we'll put a question and answer mm -hmm. now. Yes. So. so we'll be taking some questions from the audience um, and we have some questions offline as well. Mm. Okay. So one question offline we have received is, how does the BIROC method differ from micro fragmentation? Okay, <clears throat> yes, well, micro fragmentation is not new. Uh, first of all, it's presented as that, but Charles Darwin knew all about it. It's been known to coral reef researchers since about 1807. That Corals, fragments that are attached solidly to clean sea floor will continue to grow and propagate. So we've known about that microfragmentation in the sphere all along, it's not new. Problem is that when you fragment corals and put them in other places, in most cases they die because of bad water quality. If the water's too hot, too muddy, too polluted, too much sewage, fertilizer, mud, everything else, you can transplant all the corals you want into those places and they, they will die. And the problem with the fragmentation method is that it's unavoidable. The waters that they put them in are, are too, get too hot or too polluted. So they do well as long as they have perfect conditions. They'll grow not nearly as fast as biorock, because I say we accelerate the growth many fold, but when they fragment the corals and simply transplant them, they will die as soon as it gets too hot, too muddy, or too polluted, or, or diseases strike. And then they will all die because the disease passes from one to another. So we are doing fragmentation in a sense. We, we collect naturally broken corals, we rescue and we propagate those. The ones we propagate are usually in very bad condition when we rescue them. But we grow you know, whole reefs out of these little tiny fragments, which we can then propagate on our structures um, at a much faster rate. But basically microfragmentation is being done by people who want to do something to save reefs. They mean well, they're really trying to do the right thing, but it's a technique that just doesn't work in the long run. In the long run, it is going to fail. Almost all the fragmentation projects that have been done in the Pacific died from bleaching. The ones in the Caribbean died from hurricanes or bleaching or diseases. So it just doesn't work long run. So if they want that, that kind of method to work, they need to transplant them onto bio rock reefs. That's the only way we'll have hope. What we're trying to do is set up bio rock arcs all around the world to save the species. We're growing about 80% of all the coral genera in the world and maybe half the species, but we want to 
get all of them because we need to have reserves of corals and biodiversity of all the key species everywhere. You know, we need to have these, these arcs just to preserve the species because the threats are going to get much worse in the years to come. Thank you. Tom. We have another question offline. Um, what is the oldest Byrock project? Um, well, okay, the oldest Byrock project I would say would be projects Wolf Hilberts did in 1976 in Louisiana. Now at that point, he did, we didn't have the word biorock. Wolf, Wolf um, used to call it secrete or cement or mineral accretion. And uh, he was, as I say, trying to grow building materials in the sea. And he began working in Texas and Louisiana, trying to build materials that he would then take out of the water. Um, in the 1980s, I heard about his work and I asked him to come to Jamaica to work with me. We began working on corals. We never had the time to get back to the building material. We worked for 20 years all around the world building these projects, but focused on coral reef regeneration. Um, sorry, let me... Um, what was the question? The, the no. oldest Byron. Yes, yes. So in 87, the oldest ones that we built, and those were the first ones that were designed for coral reefs were in 87. And what we, um, at that point, I, I coined the name bio rock instead of mineral accretion because it conveyed the notion of a living stone that was growing, which is what we're building. So bio rock is a term we use, but there are all the terms. Mm -hmm. We do have another question. What is the best way to reduce human pollution going into the oceans? Composting toilets and constructed wetlands. Well, yes, th thank you, Dave, for that question. Um, there, uh, all of those things are needed. I mean, the key thing is to prevent the nutrients getting into the water in the first place. What we really want to see is that, that those nutrients get recycled on land where they're needed. The thing is that we use those nutrients extremely inefficiently. What they, what they do is that most of the fertilizer that gets dumped on the land, the plants can't take up. It gets flushed right into the rivers, into the sea, and it causes harmful algae blooms that poison people and kill ecosystems. So it's wasted and it's damaging. Now, if those nutrients were recycled on land, we wouldn't have to buy fertilizer to replace the nutrients we're losing. So it's madness to be throwing them into the sea. We're damaging both the land and the sea, and we can protect both by recycling them. So constructed wetlands work very well. We just have to manage them properly. Um, we've really got to stop polluting the oceans if we want to regenerate. Thank you. Um, seems like that is all the questions that the that's all for um, the questions. If you guys have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us um, either at our info at blueregeneration.com address or directly to me. Um, any other queries or questions you might have? Let, let me just add a couple of things. I mean, this, this technology is, is one that really can be used to regenerate, we believe, just about any marine ecosystem. We can make floating reefs, we can make reefs in the deep sea, we can make reefs clean up polluted harbors and bays, um, and filter the water. There's a lot of opportunities. Um, so we're really trying to develop projects every place that people have coast problems and try to help them solve their problems. So bio, bio rock can be used for pretty much anything. So we're looking for people who have problems they need to solve and we're ready to work with them. So we're looking for partners to develop solutions. Mm -hmm. So once again, thank you everyone for joining um, our presentation today. Uh, we will be posting it on our website offline for those who couldn't make it. And um, as I just mentioned, if you have any other additional questions or queries, uh, any kind of partnership ideas, we will be more than happy to speak with you. Um, thank you once again, and I'll be ending the meeting now. <laughs>